take a moment to settle in together and just feel where you are and see how much your body can feel right now. Let's start right there. As you scan yourself, like how much of you is here? How much of you can you sense? How much can feel the room around you? Especially what you're sitting or standing on, like how much of you can feel what's supporting you? It's such a simple question, but it's quite profound when you really pause and feel into it. You start to notice like, oh, my legs, I didn't even know they were there until now. Or, oh, my back's like really tense, I didn't notice until now. Just scan the body for a moment and see what's constricted, what's softened, and what's here and what isn't. Just for 30 seconds and just see what shows itself to you. This is a really simple practice of just learning how to track and scan the body. Not even change anything, but just track and scan, right? And before we get into today's session together, I want to welcome you. This is what we call Community Somatics. My name is Luis Mojica, for any of you who haven't worked with me before. I'm a somatic educator, a trauma therapist, nutritionist, and I, I essentially just teach people how to feel safe in their body and how to explore their body. So we'll be doing, I'm not sure what we're going to do today yet. I'm going to wait to hear from you all and get a sense. But first, I just want to introduce you to my team. So I'll ask Marika to introduce herself first. Hi, everyone. I'm Marika. I'm the operations manager here at HLN. You're welcome to um, uh, reach out to me through chat if you have any questions or you want to, if you missed something that Louise said today, that type of thing. You're also welcome to, to ask me about anything that we offer at HLN. And Evan. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Evan. I'm the admin and tech support person here at Holistic Life Navigation. And I'm also a sound healing practitioner and I offer sound healings through the course and through membership. And yeah, the same as Marika, if you have anything you feel like coming up, either questions or questions about the space right now, or about other offerings, uh, feel free to DM me. So these two will be here to support you anyway through this meeting. So like I said, you can DM them. Um, Marika will be co-facilitating, so she'll be monitoring hands and chat. So if you have anything, make sure if you go to the chat, you can click Evan or Marika, if you send it to me, I'm not going to get it. So make sure any questions or anything you need addressed, you send to one of them. And you can also, if you look at the bottom where it says reactions, you can click raise hand. That's how you can raise your hand when it's time to share and, and answer or ask questions. So the first thing I want to know is your intentions of being here. Like, what do you want to learn? What do you want to go over? What hosts of mine have you read and you're curious about something? What podcasts have you listened to? What situation are you currently going through? Like, what do you want to bring here to throw in this cauldron that I will stir? And then we will make some fun soup together out of this session. Tell me that. Bring the ingredients. And everyone gets 30 seconds to share that. So Marika is going to be keeping the time. And she'll also call on each person. And when it hits 30 seconds, she's just going to say, time. And so when you hear her say time, just finish the sentence that you're in, and then we'll move on to the next person. And we just do, you know, 10 minutes worth of this just to get a really good sense of what's here and what's wanted. If you don't want to ask out loud for whatever reason, you can simply just DM Marika or Evan. They'll ask anonymously for you. Okay. These are recorded. They do go to my podcast eventually. They do go to YouTube. So please keep that in mind as you navigate being seen and being recorded here. We can't edit anything out. So that in mind, I'll turn it over to Marika. Um, Giannis, please come off mute. Hello. Uh, yeah, so my question is, um, my healing is going pretty well and I'm expanding my capacity. However, I'm, <clears throat> I'm seeing that uh, the need for titration is ever present because I get overwhelmed. I am putting myself out there with my music. And it's like, um, yeah, it overwhelms my body. So I would like if you could speak about titration and expansion. I'd love to. Thanks, Giannis. 
Um, and also, if I mispronounce your name, please just correct me. Um, Nikita, please come off mute. Hi. Um, yeah, it's my first time here. So I think I'm just interested in um, working with like the tension patterns within my own body. So like trying to stay more aware of them and maybe hope to kind of like understand what they're about and move through them somehow, because some of these patterns are like 10, 15 years old. Great. Thanks, Nikita. Welcome. Um, Christine, was it? Hi, um, thank you so much for your work. I really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to learn how to live with big sensations, kind of like, how do you, how do you let them move through you? I don't understand that concept. Thank you. Yep, we'll definitely address that. Thank you. Shannon, please come off mute. Hello. I um, It's probably the recent post of, I don't have to be offended easily because I have trauma. Um, I uh, have PTSD and currently remain in the job. And um, it's probably my biggest thing, hurdle is to not react uh, because of so many sensations in my body. So I think that's the one that I struggle with the most and would like to know how to handle and manage that. You got it. Absolutely. These are great, by the way. I'm loving this. Keep them coming. Anne, please come off mute. Hi. I feel like shame is this root of so many uh, issues that I have, and I'm really interested to understand how to address it somatically. And just a deconstruction and PS I've learned so much from all your fawning uh, education and really love like that kind of lens on shame. Excellent. Yeah. I was just walking in the rain today and like giving a, a lecture in my brain about shame. <laughs> I was thinking I really want to be able to speak about this soon. So thank you. I'm going to get that lecture today. Amanda, please come off mute. Um, hi, Louise. Hi, everybody. It's really good to be here today. Um, I guess my question right now is um, I am in the process of manifesting a new job and I really want my next job to be I want my I want to be able to step into my power more in my life through trusting safety in my body. And I really want to go into my next job with less fawning. And I guess I'm just wondering if you can speak more to, um, I guess, leveling up in life through trusting these practices in your body. I hope that makes sense. It does. It does. <laughs> and I'm going to say for Marika, let's choose one more person for a video response because these are really good and I, I can't do any more. <laughs> there's, there's just too much here already. And then we'll check the DMs and then we'll get into it. Um, Isaiah, go ahead and come off mute. I thank you. Um, so I'm witnessing patterns in myself when I notice myself go towards a response. And so I'm able to witness myself wanting to go to this response. And like, for example, for sugar or something. And I'm curious about the process of when I notice that response in my body, I have this desire to go to sugar. It's because I am running away from some other thing that's scared to be felt. Um, what's the next step there in a more practical term? Excellent. Thanks, Isaiah. Uh, Marika, I'm going to go to you first. Anything in the chat that should be spoken? Yes. Um, so somatic tools have really come up with um, uh, when it comes to anxiety, um, when it comes to feeling sensation in the body, um, safety and social anxiety. There's also actually a lot of um, shame-based mm -hmm. um, inquiries. So I feel like that's kind of aligned today. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, how to move through overwhelming shame and shut down also when triggered in a group. Beautiful. Evan? Yeah, I also got a bunch of questions, um, but generally... Um, most of the topics were around how to become more embodied, just a general inquiry on how to get there. Um, also, how to manage uh, high 
activation experiences, um, what to do in those kinds of moments when you're, you have a lot of activation or trigger happening, um, as well as a question about if trauma can show up as other health symptoms. Great. So let's, let's start with that second last one that Evan posed about high sensations, because I'm hearing that from other people and throughout. And that's really the foundation of my work is, is how to be with high sensations. When we're talking about stress or we're talking about trauma, we're talking about high sensational experiences. So the stress isn't the event. The trauma isn't the event. It's how your body responds to it happening. And the way the body responds to these events is via sensation. It's a huge biochemical sensational experience. Excess adrenaline, excess blood pressure, tightening a, a, a constriction, a vasoconstriction, you know, the blood vessels and, and capillaries to move your blood up to your eyes and your face and your brain so you can orient. This is what happens when you have a stress response or when you have a trauma response. So it's very biological, it's very, very physical and physiological, and it's high sensation. It's like electricity, it's not even like, it's loads of electricity moving through your nervous system, hitting your brain, lighting you up. And what's fascinating about it is this is a good thing. You know, it's not pleasant, but it's actually a good thing because this stress and this tension and this charge is meant to be a propellant. It's meant to turn into action. So I will often teach people that the very first stage of movement is activation, is constriction, is stress. So I want to start there just for you all to feel that for yourselves. The first stage of movement, right, is activation. When you feel lit up, when you feel uh, stressed, when you feel pressure somewhere, constriction, that's your body getting ready to organize into some kind of expression. Now, the issue is the expression for many reasons doesn't tend to happen. So instead of expression occurring, repression occurs. This is especially true in the freeze and the fawn trauma responses. Fawn where you're appeasing and people pleasing people instead of saying what you really want. And freeze, which is also collapse, where your body's literally shutting down. This is where you feel depressed. This is where you kind of lose track of what you're saying. You feel stuck. You can't really move. You're unmotivated. These are the freeze and collapse expressions. So I just, I just want you to really feel into that. Stress isn't something to get rid of. It's something to use. And when stress is too much for the body because it isn't being used, isn't able to be used, it becomes trauma. It overwhelms the system so much that then we go into this place where we have a break from ourselves, where we disconnect, where we go numb, can't really feel where we are anymore. We're kind of floating above our experiences. We're not in them anymore. That's when we're actively dissociated because there's so much energy that's unable to be used. It's just kind of building up somewhere in the body. And we're not meant to just build that up long term. We're meant to repress it for a very short term and then express it when we're safe. Yet the issue with having a brain or like a mind, a conscious mind, the issue and the beauty, you know, the beauty of it is imagination and the ability to kind of relate to the body in the psychedelic way. The issue is memory keeps coming up. So you have a hard time perceiving where you are now. You have a hard time perceiving that threat is currently not happening. So there's the mental and somatic remembrance of what has occurred, you know, actual threat or overwhelm that has occurred, the body's feeling it as if it's happening now, and or it's expecting more of it. So on a biological level, you're feeling a real physiology of stress, whether it's happening or not. And that's why it's so difficult to get out of chronic stress and trauma response because you're biochemically feeling what you felt when you were in a real time threat, right? So you're essentially sandwiched between past and future. Something that has happened, something that hasn't happened yet, yet the body is prepared and waiting and feels like threat is everywhere. And so when I say that, I want to pause to so just, you can feel that for yourselves. You can catch up to that what I'm saying. And visually, you can look around where you are and you can visually see right now there's no threat, right? Doesn't mean you feel it, but you can see it. And I want you all to notice that right now. Look, really look around the room where you are. Let your eyes show you. The walls are standing up. There's no one after me in this moment. 
I have electricity, I have a phone, I have something I'm looking at. You're not in an active place of threat right now. You might be stressed, you might be tired, you might be recovering from those things or expecting them, but is it happening now? And if the answer is no intellectually, can the body feel that no? That's the catch-22 with, with chronic stress and trauma. The body has a hard time actually perceiving your current reality, which is right now there's no threat. Now, what's so important about that is when your body learns to perceive right now there's no threat, it doesn't mean trauma response gets turned off. It just means it takes a break. Like your stress responses and trauma responses, they just rest. They just kind of, okay, I'm going to rest until needed. And when there's a threat coming or a possible threat coming, bam, they're right back in action. So you never have to worry about being unprotected. That's never going to happen. Your body's too primed, you know, for survival. What we have to practice and teach the body more is how to feel its current state of safety. Safety comes from perceiving non-threat. It doesn't come from a safe space. It comes from the perception that the space is safe. That's why you can't introduce safety. We, we have these beautiful intentions and concepts of I'm going to be safe for you. I'm going to, it, it's not the reality. The power is in the individual to perceive the safe person, to perceive the safe space, rather than this kind of passive, disempowered idea of you give me safety. The safety is already in me. It needs to connect to where it is right now. So once you perceive non-thread, you connect to where you are. Relationship actually occurs. We are not dissociated or disconnected. You're relating to the plant. I'm relating to the faces on the screen. I'm relating to the chair I'm sitting on. And it's telling my body in real time, everything's okay right now. And that's the difference between being in the, let's say like the nightmare of what happened and the expectation of what might happen and being in the somatic moment, the reality of right now is not happening. And in the right now, it's not happening. The body starts recovering. And this is why I'm, I'm starting to trans, you know, transform my own language from healing trauma to recovering. Because healing, which I still use and agree with, healing has a connotation of there's an end where like I'm healed. And I don't really think that's true for stress. I think stress is a human experience. It's not a bad thing. It's something we have, like I said, to propel you out of situations, to create innovation, motivation, creativity, boundaries, anger, all these things come up to tell you something's not working. You want to feel stress. It's good to connect to that and then use it and move from it, right? So to say I'm healing my stress, well, it's never gonna be healed. It's always gonna come back. It's more like I'm learning how to recover from stress. I'm learning how to recover from trauma when it's not happening right now. Because there are people that I have worked with who are actively in crisis, meaning in a, an hour from now, they need to go into a situation that is potentially threatening for them. That's real for them. Can they, until that hour is up and they go into this situation, can they feel the moment right now while I'm not in threat? That's what recovering from stress and trauma really is. And I want us to just touch into that, feel that. This is that question someone gave around moving and being with big sensations. We reflexively constrict when a big sensation comes in. That's the, that's the, the inherited uh, habit. That's what keeps us in a state of overwhelm. And that's what eventually becomes syndromal, which is illness, like the question Evan asked, the, the, the connection between illness and trauma or stress. They are absolutely connected. If anything, they're mostly at the root of most illness is chronic stress and trauma. Why? Because chronic stress and trauma is a situation where your body is bathed in adrenaline. Adrenaline is inherently inflammatory. So you're meant to be bathed in adrenaline to outrun a predator for like 10 minutes. And then you're meant to like collapse and take a nap or eat food or laugh or get a hug or shake it off. And then that adrenal adrenalized state goes away and your body regulates. So it leaves that inflamed high blood pressure place. What happens when it doesn't leave? What if you're chronically in stress or trauma response? You're chronically bathed in adrenaline. You're chronically inflamed. You're chronically constricted in certain places. That becomes syndromal. 
this is where we see thyroid issues. This is where we see gut issues, especially like IBS and Crohn's and colitis. This is where we see inflammatory based illnesses, especially the kind that took you years to diagnose because they weren't showing up on any test. These are often the trauma and stress induced illnesses we have. Why? Because our bodies don't know how to recover and perceive right now I'm okay. So we just stay in that constricted stress place. As we start to teach our bodies how to unfold into big sensation, guess what happens? The big sensation moves us. It creates expression instead of illness and pain. The pain and the illness come from pressing all that energy inwards it's meant to come out. You know, I don't know if you've heard like that, that statement, that phrase, the opposite of depressed is express, that that's all it's about. It's a depression, a literal pushing in all this life force that wants to push out. So just even feeling that for yourselves for a moment, it's not intellectual. It's not about understanding your childhood. It's not about going through memories that were painful. That adds to chronic stress and trauma. That's, you know, ruminating on things that have happened to us. That adds to the biochemistry I'm talking about that creates illness. It's great to identify and validate, but then stop. <laughs> if it keeps going, it keeps building. And that's what really propelled me. That stress propelled me into somatic psychology because I was in my 20s hit with all these flashbacks I had completely blacked out and started going to therapy for it. And every therapist I went to, you know, I went to multiple therapists for a number of years trying to like figure this thing out. Every therapist I went to, I told my story to all over again. I mean, not just in one session, like months of, of bathing in my horrible stories. And my panic disorder came back. My insomnia came back. My stomach issues came back. I was like a wreck physically and mentally. And it wasn't until I saw a somatic therapist that someone just said, hey, see this woman, she's a somatic therapist. I had no idea what it was, but there was like an instinct to try it. And when I was telling her my horrible traumatic experience, five minutes into it, she said, stop right there. And no one ever did that. She said, pause. Where do you feel that in your body? And it was that moment I was like, oh my goddess, every time I talk about this experience, my body is hurting. I had no idea before that moment. And that was what was like the light bulb moment for me of this animal body is totally fine right now until I'm identified and attached to that experience. It was fine until I brought it up. So in therapy, I was constantly ruminating in the room and outside of the room, in my journal, with my friends, in spaces of healing, constantly identifying and reliving my story, constantly invoking the sensations in the biochemistry of trauma and stress. The somatic therapist in three months after years of, of not knowing what to do with this, got my body to a place of finally being able to feel when it was okay. And I was like, I need to learn this shit. <laughs> this looks good. Like, can you teach me how to do this? And she was my mentor for a while. And then I went to a three-year program with somatic experiencing and learned it. And now I help assist in teaching it because I think it's so brilliant. And actually on Friday, we have a course right now. Um, Evan will put the link in the, in the chat. A seven-week course coming up on Monday. And this Friday registration closes. So check out the course if you want to go really deep with this because I teach all of this there. But I'm going to teach you some stuff today for free. So I'm saying all this because we are so reflexive in our culture of getting rid of pain, not opening up into pain. It sounds crazy. Intellectually, it makes no sense. Why would you move toward the pain? You know, let's get away from it. Let's numb it so we can be productive. But pain and stress and, and, and tension and activation, again, they're supposed to move us. They're actually creative energies. So we want to learn let me do this when I feel anxiety instead of this. And I'm going to teach you all a really simple practice right now. Grab a pillow. And if you don't have a pillow, you can use your hands, but a pillow is much more preferred. So you may have to go get one, go get one. I'll wait. And what I want you to do is just identify something mildly stressful in your life right now, something annoying, something frustrating, something you're a little anxious to do, maybe. And the first thing you need to do is locate where that lives in you. 
where do you feel that in your body? Where is that tension? Where is that pressure? Where is that constriction? Put your hand wherever that lives first. Even if you have the pillow, move the pillow a little and put your hand wherever that is. Just so you can touch into it. We're not soothing it. We're just saying, here is where my body holds the stress of what's happening right now or what happened or what's about to happen. And that's kind of like a second part of this question. Notice, is it happening now or is my body holding it as it recollects that it already happened or it's coming up? So this gives you a little sense of the now compared to the past and the future and how the body feels it as if it's happening now. You can look around with your eyes. Is the thing happening now? And it's not a trick question. For some of you, it might be like, yeah, the leak from my roof is like dripping in front of me right now. It's stressful. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. If it's not happening now, notice that too. Just see what it is. Okay, now with that pillow, hold that pillow against your body and give it a hug or a press and really find the right hug, like find the right pressure that feels really gooey and delicious. And notice what part of you softens. Is it your face? Is it your belly? Yeah, those of you without the pillow, just a nice self-hug is perfect. Is it your stomach, your arms? What part of you is like softens and feels okay with this pillow? Just notice. And now to add to that, open your eyes and take in something in the room you like. Hopefully not the leak in the roof. It's like, don't look at that one. Look at the other side of the room. Look at a plant. Look at a window. Look at a painting an instrument, a pet, a person, whatever it is, something you love, and feel where that lives in your body. Locate the area that feels where you are right now. The pillow is the first thing that shows you where you are because it's currently with you. The environment is the second thing that shows you where you are. What parts of your body can feel where you are? Identify those. And then you allow that place that was stressed, that was tense, that had like a mild irritation or anxiety, you allow that place to feel these parts. You let them be together. Now, one way is a practice called pendulation that I love, which you literally just breathe in between the two. Take a breath into the stressful place and feel it for a couple seconds. And then put your breath to the place that isn't stressed, that feels some pleasure, that feels some delight. And you move back and forth. Sometimes just knowing they're all there, like, oh, here I am in the room. The place that's tense or constricted starts to shift. DM Marika, let us know what's happening for you right now because I want to have a sense of how your bodies are feeling this in this moment so I can speak to it. So I'm going to pause for like 30 seconds while some people write in and she'll anonymously speak for you. And I'm going to explain what we're doing and then we'll hear what people are feeling. And there's no right answer, by the way. With somatics, there's never a guarantee. It's an exploration. Like, what's my body doing with this practice? Not, it should be doing this. It doesn't work that way. But what I'm teaching you is how to start sensationally coming back to the present. How to notice something stressful and where it lives in you. And then sensationally touch into where you are. And that's the beginning of teaching this animal body how to open up into its present state of safety and let some of that stress move through it or shift, transform instead of being stuck and not opening up to where it is. So what are we hearing, Marika? Um, a series of yawns and my eyes start watering. Feeling strong emotions leading into tears. Body still feels threatened as it's experienced the threat of a breakup. Sleepy. Feeling numb, not sure if I feel anything. Feeling safety and threat both in the same place. Um, softening, ease, relaxation. Tension in my throat, softening in my face. Um, that feels like a light release. Integration with breath. Um... Tears are, Tears are okay. Perfect. Let's end there. So the reason why I love getting this feedback is notice how diverse the responses are, as they should be, because every body is different. Every situation is different. So what you're all learning is how deep is the rupture? How deep is the stress? Is it able to sense where I am right now? Even the individual with the breakup, which that's, I get that. It's an internal thing that you're carrying with you. Can the part that feels broken up right from this feel something pleasant in the room? The chest where the heartbreak might be might not be able to, but 
the feet might feel really good on the rug. You know, you're noticing what parts of me can actually recover and feel where they are now, rather be oriented to the stress that happened, is happening outside of me, or is about to happen. That's what we're looking at. And again, there's no right or wrong. There's a noticing, is my body able to feel where I am? Most of you had a shift, a few of you didn't, and someone said, actively feels threatened. That's all, to me, that's all success because you were able to track what was happening inside of you. The tracking is the goal, not the expected result. That's going to come on its own time because the body is sovereign. It's a creature. You can't make it feel good. You can try. You can't make it. But you can learn how to track and speak to this creature and show it where it is and connect to it. And then you see from there how it responds. So that's kind of like the foundation before I move into these other pieces, which are a little more uh, complex, especially with, with uh, shame. But I first wanted to say something Giannis brought up because it's important. Titration with expansion. It is so intellectual and understandable to think that expansion and good things and like, who was it? Uh, uh, Amanda said about leveling up. Like the more you're seen, the more opportunities you have, the more it comes into your life. That also has a charge associated with it. When I talk about big sensation, I'm not just talking about horrible things. I'm also talking about really beautiful amazing things because life is sensational whether it's i'm in love with you or you broke my heart there's a sensation to that what's my body's capacity to be with that sensation regardless of the source that's really what we look at with the somatic work the way i teach it does my body constrict against it does it open into it now when you have a history of your body constricting against big sensation your body and your mind start to overcouple or, or and associate constriction with safety. It feels protective. And this is why we are uh, very, very much drawn and attracted to, quote, negative people, stressful movies, even stressful music, food that stresses out our body. We get attracted to situations and people and places that constrict us because the body feels really safe being constricted. It doesn't feel as safe being exposed and open and unprotected. That's what expansion is. So titrating expansion is like an, an advanced technique because we don't tend to think of it that way. We think, well, of course I want to expand. Then you dive into it and then you burn out and you call it self-sabotage. But it's really that your body hasn't learned to feel safe being open. So it gets really overwhelmed by that openness. So you have to go really slow. And it takes me back to a client I had where we were just practicing opening the hands. Because whenever she would start talking, she would reflexively grab a pillow and curl around it, which was great. That was her resource. But then we play with, let's put the pillow down and see what happens. And she would get this far and start trembling and crying and have to come back. And so every week we would just play with how big can you get and feel safe? And eventually she did. And it was interesting that it also uh, correlated with weight loss. Whenever she lost a certain amount of weight, she would have extreme fear and anxiety because parts of her were being open and seen. She was releasing protection that she had. So we want to understand expansion and peace and being open, gorgeous theories and ideologies, but to somatically experience that after a lifetime of being constricted, not that easy. And this is where that question Giannis brings in, titration, the word titration comes in. Titration means small baby steps. I go into a little bit of expansion, I notice my edge, then I let myself contract and retreat consciously, and then I go back. So it's not full on immersion therapy where I just dive in and deal. And it's not avoidance. It's a pendulation between I, have, I pull back when it's too much and recover. And then I take that recovery, that capacity now, and I go back to a little more expansion and I go back and forth. And with that, you get great, great success in like, as Amanda called it, leveling up like being open to more coming into your life, whether it's like five new flowers for your garden or a new friend or a promotion or a traveling, whatever it is, it doesn't matter how big or small it is, something new, something that causes you to receive and open and be seen, you have to titrate to get there. This is why self-sabotage exists. It's the body's way of preventing you from doing something you don't have capacity for yet. And we call it self-sabotage, which I completely <laughs> despise because it's not self-sabotage. This is not self-hatred. This is not consciously hurting yourself. This is a reflexive mechanism to protect you from something you can't handle yet. You think you want it, 
You have the desire for it. You don't have the capacity for it. So your desire outweighs your body's ability to handle it. So you move toward it from a desire place rather than a somatic place. And then your body is like panicking and does something to fuck it all up. And then you call it self-sabotage when really all it's doing is helping you avoid something that could potentially like wreck you because you don't have capacity yet. So anytime you find yourself doing something you would call self-sabotaging, try to shift it into, oh, it's reminding me to titrate. It's reminding me I wasn't ready for that yet. Let me take a break for a couple of days and then slowly go back toward it. Rather than what's wrong with me, why can't I handle anything? I'm never going to get better. All these things that come, I should be farther along now. All that, which is going to lead to the shame I'm going to talk about, is not going to serve any of this when we're trying to titrate into expansion and we're trying to recover from maybe a lifetime of stress or trauma. It doesn't help to expect sudden expansion to be just easily felt and, and, and accepted, right? Hey, my friends, I created a space that is affordable, accessible, and anyone is allowed to join anytime. And it's called the library membership. The library membership is an online private platform that hosts dozens of my webinars, my somatic practices, private mini lectures, and movement practices. There's also a monthly sound healing and you'll be invited to a weekly Tuesday live mini practice with me and other participants. You'll also be invited to be a live audience member in our monthly HLN team podcast recordings, where you'll take place in the Q&A that happens off air after the episode is filmed. For more information on this membership, click on the link below or go to holisticlifenavigation.com and click on membership and then library. You can join right now and you can cancel or pause your subscription at any time. I look forward to seeing you in there. And this is where shame comes in. This is what was my lecture I was giving myself as I was walking through the rain today. Shame is so fascinating to me as someone that had a ton of it. It's so fascinating to me because shame actually has a really important purpose to protect us. It's a protective mechanism. So let's think about it somatically. Everyone can think right now, like you can feel it. Think about something you feel ashamed of or a time in your life you were shamed, right? Notice the closing that happens. You don't feel shame and like hold your head up, right? You feel shame and you start to collapse in on yourself. Like I immediately feel my viscera pulling me in like a shell. And let's all play with it. Let's really feel like let yourself just pull in, feel that. Feel how what's happening is you're protecting your internal organs. There's a protective mechanism I'm curling in to kind of hide from this environment I'm in, right? Now, why would we want to do that? Why is this like a sophisticated thing? If I'm in a situation, let's say with an abusive parent, this is just one example, and I am shamed or I feel shame for something. What I'm really feeling somatically is the instinct to curl up and hide. And the shame uh, kind of elicits that. The shame allows me to curl up and protect myself. So shame in a small dose in like that situation, life-saving. Because it's making me hide and shut down. So I'm not seen by people or places where I could be hurt or harmed. It has a purpose. What happens is because we don't have an animistic relationship to shame, we identify with it. We start attaching a story of I am the shame, I'm ashamed of, and we carry it all the time. So it's not like a 10-minute thing that helps me survive a situation. It becomes like a 10-decade thing. My life spans with this posture of shame. My shoulders are curled. I don't speak. I don't, maybe I don't make eye contact. I withdraw easily. I fawn. And that's the only way I can relate to people by reflecting them back to themselves. And then when I am brought into it, I freak out and hide. This is the posture of shame. Now, the catch 22 that I was lecturing myself about is what's fascinating is you can't move through shame unless it's exposed. Yet, the very somatic mechanism of shame is to hide. So it's this really interesting experience where your body's hiding, which it's supposed to do in a situation that's shameful. Yet, the only way to get rid of the shame is to open it and have it be exposed. This is where conscious witnessing comes in. And this is the real psychedelics and spiritual aspect of somatics. 
Somatics for me is just a really fancy word for I'm learning to not identify with my body. I'm learning to become a witness to my body. So the things that I experienced in this lifetime, my body went through, I didn't, which sounds spiritually bypassing at first when you start sitting with it. It is so accurate. It's like that person hurt my body, but who's me? Who's the one even saying my body? That's the conscious witnesser. I'll show you right now. Find a place again that hurts. It could be soreness from working out. Like, it doesn't have to be a horrible hurt. It could be a little tension. It could be hunger. Like, find a sensation that's a little unpleasant and just take your hand and put it there. And I want you to notice what happens when you just identify the sensation. No expectation. You're just identifying it and putting a hand there. Notice how you are witnessing this sensation inside of you. You're not the sensation. You're witnessing it. This is what happens with shame except we don't realize that we can witness it. We think we are it. So I feel ashamed, right? Or there's shame in my gut. I have anxiety or there's anxiety in my chest. You see the difference? I am stressed or there's all this stress in my jaw. I can identify with the state or I can identify the state. I can see where it lives in me, or I can identify as it. I see people's Instagram accounts in their bios that say chronically stressed, chronically ill, like literally identifying with these states. And I once did it, so I'm not shading anybody. I'm like in solidarity laughing about it because I've done it, right? Childhood survivor of sexual assault. Like that was the title I was really proud of for a while because I finally had a reason why I was acting like I was acting and feeling like I was feeling. All these memories came back. I was finally validated. Yet, identifying with the experience kept my body in the physiology of the experience. Right now, I'm a human in a chair. I'm not a survivor of assault. Right now, I'm in a chair with you. The moment I think about the assault, Oh, yeah, I survived something. I can feel tension in my stomach. And now here I am in a chair. But when I used to talk about it, even to one person, I would be flooded with panic. And now I talk about it in front of hundreds of people. And it's like, oh, yeah, that happened. Not even to minimize it, because I went through hell reliving it. But to understand it's not happening now and the safety that comes from that. So the shame serves a purpose. Everything your bodies do that we think we need to fix or heal, it's serving a purpose. The, the, the remedy for most of these states and ongoing stressors and, and chronic illness from these stressors is feeling where you are now. Because when you feel where you are now, your animal body instinctually takes over and knows how to recover. You don't have to do the healing yourself. It will do it for you. The only thing you have to do is show your body where it is. And the, the best analogy for this, any of you that have kids or can remember being a kid, is when your child wakes up in the middle of the night from a nightmare and they're crying and they're yelling for you and you come in the room and there are, they are experiencing it as if it's happening in the room and you turn on the light and you open the closet and you show them around. You're like, sweetie, there's no monsters here. It was just a dream. And what happens? Their body realizes it was just a dream and they feel where they are now and they start to settle. I don't make my daughter settle. Her body settles when she realizes where she is. That's what we're doing in the way I teach somatic trauma recovery. We're teaching our bodies to feel where they are. And we're teaching them through nutrition. This comes to Isaiah's question, the desire for sugar and how to interrupt it. I love when like a reflect, a compulsive desire comes up because it's a signal. It's like a smoke signal from a place inside of us that has an unmet need. And what tends to happen is we focus on the behavior, but we don't get curious about the root of the behavior. So I'm looking at the sugar snacking or the sugar craving or the sugar addiction, and that's my focus. But that's like the least important thing. The important thing is from where in my body does this emerge from? It's like a flower. Where does it blossom from? And we're, we're kind of a complex ecosystem of roots. You have to kind of trace back the root of that one flower and you feel in your body where it is. How? 
easiest thing. The moment you're engaging in addictive behavior or you have a compulsion or a craving coming up, set an alarm for five minutes and notice what part of your body feels stress. That's all you have to do. We can do it right now together. Actually, Isaiah, do you want to do a demo? Let me make it so you can unmute. Do you feel like you have capacity for that? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. So okay. can you spotlight us, Marika? So just be a real quick one, like five, 10 minutes. We'll just drop in together. Thank you for, for diving in suddenly. <laughs> and so when you think about, so give us the thing, give us the sugar. What's like the love, like the cream, the creme de la creme. What is it? Is it okay. cream, baby? Cookies. <laughs> okay, okay. So let's like, when you think of the cookies right now, where do you, what do you feel in your body? What happens? Just when you think about them. Hmm. I feel like a heat in my stomach right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's take our time with that heat and just see what it does next. What are you noticing there? There's a pattern between um, tightness and softening. That's kind of pulsing in a the little stomach. Bit. Yeah, in the same area, but I'm noticing there's a pulsation between those two. Great. So let's grab that pillow and put it over that area and just see what does it do? What does it show you? What emerges as you hold it with the pillow a little bit? And there's again, there's no expected thing. It's like truly, what does it do? Let's just see. You tell me. It's a bit quiet. Um, I'm noticing my heartbeat in that area. Mm -hmm. And... There's almost a comfort. There's not a, uh, there's nothing to be running from or towards. It's just there. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. From that place, from that nothing to run from or toward, let's again imagine the cookies and tell me what's the somatic experience, what happens as you imagine them with the pillow. When I thought again, I, I found again heat, but it wasn't quite as uh, intense or as hot as before. So it's Beautiful. there, but it's less um, kind of in my face. Mm -hmm. Let's be with that for a moment. Let's just feel. And everyone, we're, we're noticing his body already quickly going through this cycle where at first a lot of activation, then we got the pillow, we took a moment, we we reintroduce the stressor, which is like these cookies, less activation, still some, but less. So you're seeing the body already being able to regulate this a little more. What, what happens next now? So I noticed a little bit of uh, tightness coming up my throat. Mm -hmm. So it, maybe it's shifting. Um, there's still a little bit of awareness in the stomach, but it also recognize other parts of my body. Good. When you feel that tightness moving up the throat, are there words? Are there emotions? Is there movement? Tell me what that does when you really let it do its thing. Okay. Okay, nice. Yeah, I really enjoy that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened there? What did that feel like? Like, what? where's uh, the tension with them? 
there's a pressure kind of coming up and then the release and a yawn and a softening once this kind of gorgeous gorgeous does it feel okay to land there right now yeah that's great thank you what a great drop i appreciate that thank you uh, thank you my friend i always say if you so if someone already put a heart up i always love to put uh emojis up when someone dives in so if anyone wants to do that go ahead and isaiah you can take a look and just kind of feel the reception that's a perfect i couldn't have asked for a better example <laughs> uh, if it's if it's easy easy breezy that was an easy breezy example it doesn't always happen like that but it often does but not always but it was a really quick drop in of if i interrupt this reflex which really all addiction and com compulsions all they are is the body trying to find safety if i interrupt this desire to find safety in something else and i relate to the part of me that's reaching out like that root took him right to the belly i relate to the belly what does it show me what is in need what does it do and through that self-relation to that place the activation was lower the activation in the throat turned into the yawn so that's self-regulation the body did its own thing to remediate that charge and then you sit with it and you notice, do I still want the cookies? Maybe I want one instead of five. Maybe I want none. Maybe I still want five. You, it, do, it doesn't actually matter to me. What matters is the exploration of those inner landscapes and learning how to relate to those parts, which he did really beautifully. Have you done my work before, Isaiah? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You're on mute. You can unmute. I've, I've not. I've been listening for a while and I'm studying trauma for myself, so relating it in other ways beautiful just because you dropped in so quick that's awesome so everyone else just notice for a moment what you're feeling in your bodies you know what came up from watching that what's coming up from this whole session you know we're coming to the last seven minutes or so and i think we made a really beautiful soup i loved what you brought there's so i mean there's so much more but i just can't go into it all so i'm just pausing to see what's still alive for you what wants to be spoken we have we have seven minutes you can put your hands up and we'll do really short and 30 second shares even just simple shares of what's alive for you like reflecting back to me what you're hearing just so it can be said just so it can be heard uh, i welcome any kind of feedback or questions or responses right now um heather please come off mute So I just keep noticing after my stomach would be the first thing to react, but eventually my heart just wants love and visibility. Beautiful. And you just gave it that. It's awesome. Thanks, Heather. Bella, please come off mute. Hello, this is the first time I'm uh, reaching out. I just heard about you, Luis, by a friend of mine who um, was in Costa Rica and got to experience a little bit the work you are doing over there. Uh, so this is all brand new for me. I'm figuring out what somatics is about. It's coming at a perfect time where, uh, yes, telling the story and telling the story again is not really doing it. And I'm looking at other ways of doing it. I'm considering taking your course, your seven week course afterwards. And I just wanted to come in just to see a group of people that feels like a great support. Mm, well, thanks, Bella. So, so love that you found me through a Costa Rican friend. That's awesome. Uh, let's see, uh, call in user, whoever's on the phone, please come off mute. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the session. Um, my problem is that I, if I were really to go into the letting myself curl up, I would want to stay there forever. I, I have a spasming problem and my body just keeps spasming and spasming and spasming and my teeth want to chatter and if I let them chatter, they don't stop. There's never a point at which I've processed or or stayed with it long enough, even if I'm observing. Uh, and I don't think there's a quick answer to that, but I thought I'd just put it out there at this my first session, and I plan to come back. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for coming. 
Yeah, there, you're right. There's not a quick answer, but I can just say a, kind of a, a variety of answers. Um, I've had Tourette syndrome my whole life. I've worked with people with Tourette's. I've worked with people with spasms. I've worked with people with Parkinson's. And what's really amazing is when you have any kind of tremor or any kind of spasm or any kind of involuntary movement that comes through, you learn how to recreate it by making it bigger and slower. So if like my hand does this suddenly, which a lot of people I worked with with spasms, it often was the hands. We, we, we recreate it together. So we sit together and we do this and then we do this and then we get it bigger and it becomes, and let's all do it together. You can feel in your body because this is actually great for people even that don't have spasms, but the body wants to shake or has a lot of energy. Take your hand and just do like little like quick shakes and you can feel how stressful it is, how it like rises energy. And now slowly make it a little bigger and then get your elbow involved and get your fingers and wrists involved and get your shoulder involved and feel that difference go really slow. Yeah, get as big as you want with it. I mean, you really feel the difference, at least I do. So much energy starts to move through your body. So a little spasm, a little shake, a little tremor will actually create more of an activation and more stress in the body. But when it gets bigger and slower, it starts to reduce. And then when energy moves, let's say through that channel, like the shoulder to the arm, to the wrist, to the fingers, it will move fully instead of just the end. So often a spasm or a tremor is showing us that energy is stuck somewhere. Some kind of movement is stuck somewhere that got repressed and got overwhelmed. Again, this is a general answer. I don't know your history, but it's just something that will help a lot of you who may have this or feel activation or shaking coming on to make it bigger and slower and you'll see some shifts happen. So thanks for that. We have time for one more short question or share. Um, Anita, please come off mute. Oh, hi, thank you for that. Um, this was really interesting. So I was following along with with Isaiah and um, and yeah, for sure, I've always had a sweet tooth. So I'm I'm sitting here cuddling my my beloved squishmallow antelope, and wh where I felt it was was in my throat and in my mouth. Um, so I sat here with with my squishy up against my throat and. And and yeah, I felt this this release in my neck, in my jaw, and this and this release of energy as a, as I'm kind of moving my shoulders and moving my head to release that energy. And it's very much complementary to the type of chiropractic I do. And I'm working with a counselor who also does a bit of somatic work. So um, it's just. It, it was an interesting, and another thing that's really important is that people keep telling me that there's something I need to say. And, and there's, there's so much that I haven't expressed all throughout my life, controlling narcissistic mother, bullying, blah, 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 not standing up for myself. And, and, and so that was just a really interesting connection for me that, 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 that desire for sugar is is like compensating for all these things I haven't said. That's right. Thank you. That was a really interesting revelation for me. I'm so glad you tracked that because it's incredible how those of you who have never done, ever done any somatic work in your life within minutes can get all this wisdom from your body because it's in there already. It's like no one invented your body, you know, like nature invented your body. So th these these practices are just to get you in touch with this innate wisdom and intelligence. It's already, it's like right there waiting to be seen. So just interrupting something and following it, and I love that you followed Isaiah and I, you can get all this information that comes up. And what's so fascinating about food and eating food is uh, like physically, as the food goes down your throat, it actually helps to relax your vagus nerve, which is the nerve that's responsible for being very activated and overwhelmed. So there, there's a physiological shift that takes place just from food sliding down the throat, not to mention what happens biochemically from the kind of food you eat when it's digested in your gut, which we go into detail in week two of the course. And in July, I'm doing a six month nutrition program that explains the whole connection between nutrition and trauma. So that's going to be something I'm, I'm excited to dive into after years of wanting to do and just didn't have the time. And now I do. So uh, one more time, if you look in the chat, you'll see the link. Our course starts on Monday, like six days from now. 
And this Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern, we close registration so we can get everything ready. So check out the course, check out the information, see if it, if it resonates for you. Uh, you'll learn so much about everything I just did. You'll learn all the how to in the back end. You'll get PDFs, you'll get, um, uh, there's a manual in the PDF that explains the exercises. You'll get audio exercises, you get recordings of all the classes and you get to download them all at the end. So everything is yours afterwards. So even if you can't be there live, you can get all the information. And we have a little thing called the circle space. It's like a private community while you're doing it. And my team is there for any one-on-one -on -one support and questions for the entire seven weeks. So you get a lot of support. Evan does a sound healing with Marika every Thursday for 90 minutes, which is incredible. And Camille, who wasn't here today, does a Q&A on Fridays. I teach the live lectures on Mondays and Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so the live lectures with me are Mondays and Wednesdays where we do practice. I teach you the actual practices themselves. We do demos and I lecture and teach you the behind of like, why are we doing this? What does this mean? What's the philosophy? And then Thursdays and Fridays are optional sound healing and Q&A. So that's what we do and that's what's coming up. So feel free to join us there or just come to the next, uh, I think the addiction circle is the next one we're doing in May. So in May, we'll have a free addiction circle, which we'll dive more into the somatics of addiction and recovery. So that being said, I appreciate all of you. Thank you, Marika and Evan.